Wheeljack is the mad scientist of the Autobots, always inventing new weapons and gadgets. He is most adept at driving while in car mode, and likes to show off his stunts. Wheeljack has a flying range of 800 miles using solid fuel rockets in his arms, and he shoots magnetic inducer, shrapnel needle, and gyro inhibitor shells from his rocket shoulder cannons. Wheeljack, however, is his own worst enemy, often injuring himself while experimenting with new weapons. Originating in the 1983 Japanese Diaclone Car Robo toy line, converting into a Lance Strato sports car, and specifically based on an actual real-life rally car that was detailed to advertise the logo of Italian airline Alitalia. In 1984, this modified rally car, along with its red-green detailing, was imported by Hasbro into the first wave of Transformers, becoming Autobot mad scientist Wheeljack. In G1 cartoons, Wheeljack appeared throughout seasons 1 and 2 of the series, creating inventions that would sometimes save the day, if not cause the problem to begin with. He also has the distinction of being the first Transformer we ever see on screen. And finally, in spring of 2024, Hasbro released a new version of Wheeljack that transforms into his classic Cybertronian mode. You betcha sweet ass I picked one up. Early drafts of Transformers the movie depict him as becoming a love interest for female Autobot R.C., only after spending much of the story fighting and disagreeing with her. In 1986, when the movie was released, his role was substantially reduced. In addition to zero dialogue, Wheeljack is only seen as a dead body, having been killed off-screen. Oh, spoilers. Just like that, we are back for a whole new season of Transformers. I know it was a little longer than I said it was going to be, but I am back and I promise you we're going to get through all these episodes together. Now, in the fall of 1985, there was anticipation as we knew a new season of episodes were about to come out. The previous year, we had watched those 16 episodes in repeat so many times, we didn't even believe it was really going to happen. But we knew there were new characters and new toys that came out the summer before that we'd already started collecting. And then, one day, in fifth grade, I sat down and not only did the new episode start, there was a whole brand new title sequence, and it looked awesome. So, without any further ado, this is Season 2, Episode 17, Autobot Spike. Deep within the extinct volcano that is Autobot headquarters, a strange experiment is taking place. But this experiment is not the brainchild of Autobot scientist Wheeljack, but of their human friend, Sparkplug. We are ready for your demonstration, Sparkplug. Right, Optimus Prime. Well. I just wanted to see what I could do with a big pile of spare Autobot parts and a whole lot of human ingenuity. So I built this big guy, Autobot X. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I know we're just getting started after a long break, but I gotta say, try to imagine the reaction that Sparkplug would have if Optimus Prime came to him and said, hey, I made a brand new human being out of the remains of humans that you care about. I'd have to say that Optimus and the Autobots are taking this exceedingly well. Let's get back to the cartoon. So I built this big guy, Autobot X. Wow, it's like some kind of robot Frankenstein monster. Franken what, Spike? Ah, oh, it'd take too long to explain, Bumblebee. Although saying it out loud is kind of a dead giveaway, Spike. It works. I really can't say this enough while watching this show, but what can possibly go wrong? Oh, right, this. Hey, it's not supposed to do that! Yeah. 
As Autobot X tears shit up, Trailbreaker uses his force field to turn the tide. Wow, Dad, you kind of created a metal Frankenstein's monster. Oh, Frankenstein, now I get it. Storage, at least until I get it perfected. Ratchet and I'll help. You know, I'd like to find a way to transfer mental impulses to Autobot X. Then, if an Autobot is damaged, his mind could still function in Autobot X while his body was being repaired. Wow, what a really neat science fiction idea. And a totally bizarre jump in logic. There's only one reason Teletran 1 sounds that alarm. The presence of Decepticons in the vicinity of the new Air Force rocket base. The Autobots are soon after called into action. Ironhide, Ratchet, Prowl, Windcharger, Brawn. Demand your parents to buy them all, damn it. And we'll be able to see things no one has ever... Huh? What's that? Decepticon! We can't let those evil robots sabotage this launch! It takes much energy to launch these rockets, General! That energy now belongs to us! Elsewhere, the Decepticons strike. The Autobots arrive to move in, and the cycle repeats itself. Cue the punching and shooting. Took me by surprise! So you Decepticreeps like to fly, huh? Well, take off! Braun misses the point of being here. The rocket? No. You sure we did the right thing in coming here, Bumblebee? I'm going with no. Let's see how this plays out. Oh, right. Not well. Bumblebee, Spike, Autobots, see- I sure hope Sparkplug paid his healthcare premium on time. Risking permanent spinal damage, the Autobots get Spike to a people hospital. If only there were a way of separating Spike's mind from his body while we work. From there, a professional quack makes another extreme, yet coincidental, jump in logic. Save my boy, we gotta take it. As Ratchet probes Bumblebee's rear end, the Autobots get down to some serious sci-fi shit, at last kicking the plot into full gear. Spike, my son! Spike, do you know me? It's your dad! Dad? I'm... The procedure is a success. Until it isn't. No! No! For me, all of the best Transformers stories have always involved human interactions, whether they're working together or against each other. And you have to admit, in a really interesting science fiction setting like Transformers, it was only a matter of time before they would start doing stories that involved humans and Transformers crossing over to each other's bodies. So what I've done is I've put together a small list of all the times in G1 that I could think of that humans and Transformers interfaced. In Season 1, we see Chip Chase taking control of Prowl's body in order to win a fight against the Decepticons. In an upcoming Season 2 episode called Sea Change, we see Autobot Sea Spray enter the Well of Transformation and take on a humanoid body. In the Season 3 episode Only Human, we see the consciousness of several Autobots transferred into synthetic human bodies, known as Synthesoids. This is a crossover to G.I. Joe. This is one of my favorite episodes, by the way. In the Season 3 finale, The Return of Optimus Prime, spoiler alert, human astronaut and scientist Jessica Morgan has a cybernetic exoskeleton implanted in order to enhance her legs after a debilitating accident. Hey, whatever happened to that Chip Chase character? He doesn't even show up in Season 3. I'd be pissed if I was him. 
And then of course we have Headmasters, Target Masters, and Power Masters, which are all human or humanoid companions who join with Transformers to either become their head, their weapon, or even a biotech engine that keep both bot and human alive through symbiosis. Also, they're called Headmasters. And a later strange concept included Pretender Transformers, mechanical Transformers hiding inside an organic biological body shell, leading to many different interpretations of the best way to utilize the concept, from Marvel Comics all the way to the Japanese sequel series. In Marvel Comics, Bombshell is able to manipulate and control the minds of human beings through his Cerebro shells. And of course, the strangest one of all comes from another G.I. Joe crossover. In comic books, G.I. Joe team member Covergirl and Autobot Braun fall in love and find a way through technology to conceive a child together. Did I miss any? I'm sure you'll tell me all about them in the comments. Why? Why did you do this to me? Why? Yeah. We now return to Spike, flipping his shit. Come on. Sunswipe! Sunstreaker! <laughs> With non-lethal precision, Optimus incapacitates the threat. Spike, are you... What's... what's happening to me? Give us sight. But we did the only thing we could do to save you. You'll only be in that robot body till the doctors at the hospital fix up your real one. Yeah, guess you did what you could, but it's hard to think. Like something's telling me to do bad things! Prime and a large crew return to the rocket site to clean up the damage. Having been spying the whole time, Laserbeak reports back to Megatron, as always. So, the human called Spike now possesses an Autobot body, and the state of his mind is questionable. Interesting. Perhaps I can turn this situation to my advantage and use this Autobot Spike to destroy the other Autobots. As Bumblebee makes the slowest recovery of a wounded bot so far in this series, Spike is left to a very unfortunate viewing choice. I beg of you, Dr. Frankenstein, do not go through with this unholy experiment. This creation of yours, made from mismatching parts and an evil brain, is a monster who will destroy us all! Nonsense! He will be grateful for the giant, powerful body I've given him. You see, Doctor, you've created a monster! A monster! As the symbolism of the moment is too much for Spike to bear, he tears the base apart once again, then flees. Never take me! Conveniently and suddenly back up on his feet, Bumblebee goes after him. Find out! Bumblebee, wait! I still have to repair your radio transmitter! As Spike struggles with clearly obvious choices, Reflector clues the Decepticons into his location. What a drag. Trapped inside this walking garbage can. Should I use my new size, my power to help the world like Optimus Prime does? No! Why should I? I'm not like Prime. I'm a monster! Spike, wait! It's me, your pal, Bumblebee! Bumblebee! Listen, there was a side effect to the experiment. That's making it hard for you to think right. No! You're trying to trick me! As Bumblebee's pleas failed to persuade Spike, the Decepticons arrived. What's that? As if I had to ask. Getting a taste of the power he now possesses, Spike lashes out with joy. His enemies still manage to overpower him. What a great ally he's going to make. Is it just me, or are you also kind of wishing that Marvel Sunbow did an entire animated movie out of Frankenstein? I think that would have been really cool. Anyways, 
this is the part of the episode where we learn just a little bit more about the character Wheeljack. So, it's time to jack off. Oh, I see. Roll the clip. Despite being killed before the third season of the series, Wheeljack, without explanation, appeared alive and well in the Japanese sequel series Transformers Victory. Later retcons would go on to explain this as the result of him time-traveling in order to prevent his own death. Cool, I think. After being discontinued from toy shelves, Wheeljack's involvement in the Marvel comic ironically took off. He acted as a leading voice of dissension against Grimlock's troubled rule of the Autobots, thus contacting his old friend Skylynx to intervene. Wheeljack received a non-transforming Action Master, as well as classic reissue figure in the early 1990s. The name Wheeljack would not be used again until 2002's Transformers Armada, only a different version of the character. Not to be confused with Downshift from Transformers Energon, who closely resembled G1 Wheeljack, and was clearly modeled after him. Then there is this version of Wheeljack, from Transformers Dark of the Moon. God, I don't... Look at... I don't... <sighs> Anyways, adding confusion to insult, this version of Wheeljack is sometimes referred to as Q, which is a reference to the James Bond character. Later that year, a much cooler classic-inspired design of Wheeljack appeared in Transformers Prime. This version, more of a freelance mercenary, and member of the iconic Autobot Wreckers, Wheeljack came to be a source of trouble and disappointment to his old friend Bulkhead. As the series progressed, Wheeljack learned to become part of a cohesive team. Wheeljack has also appeared sporting his classic look in the live-action Bumblebee movie, Netflix's War for Cybertron, and even Transformers Cyberverse, featuring a more jovial Wheeljack with a southern accent. And then there's this guy from Rise of the Beasts. Megatron goads an emotionally and mentally compromised Spike into joining him. Doing his best Emperor Palpatine impression, Megatron seduces Spike to the dark side of Transformers. Together we will punish those who did this to you! I... I don't know! It's getting harder and harder to think! Then let Megatron think for you, Autobot Spike! Meanwhile, back at the launch site, everyone is ready to roll on take two. One, ignition! The celebration is cut short by Bumblebee's hasty arrival. Halt! Optimus, Megatron is telling lies to Spike, and Spike's starting to believe him! I feared something like this would happen. As his friends arrive to help, a confused Spike lashes out at them. <laughs> Man, I got powers I haven't even discovered yet! Yeah, like my titty blaster. Meet my pal, Megatron! The Decepticons spring their trap. <laughs> As robots go pew pew, Prime continues to plea. Listen to me, Spike. You are not acting according to your own mind and will. He's telling you the truth, Spike. The experiment did something to your mind. Oh, it's so hard to think. Don't let them confuse you, Spike. Destroy them. At last, the one person who can get through to Spike arrives. Spike! Spike! What are you doing? Spike! Shouldn't you fight back, Optimus? No. If I destroy his metal body, I also destroy his mind. Just a reminder to the audience. Your friends! Spike! Before it's too late, Spike sees the error of his ways and chooses to save his father's life. Uh, 
as I've said, I've got powers I haven't even discovered yet. What are you waiting for, Autobot Spike? Use my power to destroy them! Just like the Autobots, Megatron fails to see the consequences he brings upon himself. You fool! You've turned my power against my own warriors! As this episode's running time gets further along, the Decepticons pull a needless retreat, allowing your local station to fit in enough commercial breaks for He-Man and fucking Rainbow Bright. You... you saved my life, son. Thanks! Dad, it was me who put you in danger in the first place. Can you ever forgive me? Spike, there's nothing to forgive. given him the best possible treatment, Mr. Witwicky. The rest is up to you and the Autobots. This doctor sucks. He did nothing. The last time I'll get to see myself from the outside. Back at Autobot base, Spike clicks his heels three times in order to come home. It's overloading! It can't take much more! Oh, wow. I'm... I'm back. Back where I belong. Even in a world of giant warring machines, heart and humanity have the truest value. I'm gonna go puke. Hmm, I wonder... I wonder what it'd be like for a robot mind to be transferred to a human. Season 3, Bumblebee. Season 3. And that, my friends, is Autobot Spike. Now, there are a few errors in this episode, not a lot. Overall, this episode looks amazing. So, let me just get through a few minor nitpicks. So, in this one shot, Ironhide falls down. He's got a solid red face like he just ate too many jalapenos. With my cybernetic attachments, I'll transfer the mind of your son into the robot form of Autobot X. The human physicians will have time to perform the operation on Spike's real body. Okay. So does this technically make Spike's body brain dead during the operation? If so, how does this benefit the surgery? He's already in a coma. I'm not trying to be a nitpicker, the whole plot depends on this. In this one shot here, the perspective on Megatron's fusion cannon is a little funky. Just like I thought, Spike's mind is- No, don't say it! Wait, just what you thought? What do you mean, just what you thought? This whole thing was your idea, asshole. Laserbeak is able to spy through an open hole in the wall of the cavern where the ship is. How is this here? Who is in charge of security? And why has this not been dealt with? This is all my fault. In this one shot here, we briefly see two Thundercrackers together. Okay, serious question, what the guy says here. Is this a movie quote? What is this from? It seems so familiar. If you know, please tell us in the comments. And we'll be able to see things no one has ever... Huh? What's that? Sparkplug has a very short distance to fall, and look at how long it takes Spike to run to the edge. Now, let's not even get into the laws of gravity and falling objects, but even if he was able to launch this claw so it would go down fast enough to catch Sparkplug, at that speed, wouldn't the impact just kill him anyways? Okay, so why does Megatron allow this to go on for as long as it does? It ultimately loses him the battle. Again, for a character who has no known weakness, he seems awfully handicapped when he transforms into a gun. I'm gonna ask one more time, why even transform into a gun? So, I'm guessing something might have been deleted here, because I'm looking at Wheeljack and he's all sad, but I don't know what he's sad about. Everything he did worked. He should be really happy. Oh, whatever. I gotta work on changing gears. Well, something tells me they are gonna do better next time. And speaking of next time, I hope you'll be back for the next episode of Leo Watches Transformers. Next time, we'll be looking at the episode Changing Gears. And I do promise you, that one's gonna arrive a lot sooner than this one did. So, in the meantime, please like, share, and subscribe. And I do have to say thank you for all the new support I've seen in the last few weeks. Please keep it up. I welcome all of our new subscribers. And if you haven't already, hey! Why not let this be the time that you make that plunge? And so, until next time, I'm going to leave you with something I just discovered recently myself. This is an alternate opening for Season 2 that we never got to see.
Thank you for watching.